We're excited to announce that Europa League will be joining our soccer picks and prediction schedule starting Tuesday, 15th February at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hosted by ex-professional soccer player Gordon Flash Watson and joined by handicapping experts Alex Campion, and representatives from La Liga Lowdown Roman the Archer and Paco Poli. Subscribe to our BetUS Soccer YouTube channel and never miss a show. Bet US, where the game begins. Welcome to Bet US. I'm Flash. It's the Premier League. We're back after having two weeks off. We had the uh, international break, even though no one really uh, went on any international break. And then obviously it was the FA Cup, which was good in some places and an absolute nightmare for others but it is match day 24 i had to quickly look down then because it's gone so so quick before we get into the nitty gritty and find you more winners please we are america's favorite sports book so subscribe get us closer to four thousand we're closing in i think it's like 280 more and we get to that magic number that was always my target if we can hit it before february then we're going to be three or four months ahead of schedule in this world cup year more importantly at the moment though is to ring the bell because if you ring the bell we'll notify you and never miss any content again like next week we will have champions league on monday as you saw in the promo it's europa league on tuesday all the leagues are back this Thursday and it's Super Bowl week. So listen, just settle back and let us entertain you. There's a song there. And there's that Robbie Williams. Let me or <laughs> us. OK, it's not me, is it? It's not I in team. OK, my uh, two, I'd say wing men, but that's sort of not quite right because I'm not the boss. So the, the three amigos are award winning owner of We Love Betting, which is Marco O'Hare and European odds compiler, digger of value and stats. And the hater of under two goals is Mark Stinchcombe, but he'll be known as Stinch. Come to you first, Mark O'Hare. It seems like that long ago, I thought I was going to have to wear a little flower so that you knew it was me. <laughs> it has been a while. Look, I, I, I don't mind an international break. I mean, I like my international football anyway, but sometimes I think it's good, a nice time to sort of take a step back, refresh reset and go back at it again it's a, it's a relentless campaign matches come thick and fast and it's quite hard to keep up sometimes especially if you're covering multiple leagues but now we're on the kind of home stretch and i think we said to, to each other off air it's going to be a really hectic period now between now and the end of march when the next international break comes along but uh, yeah buckle up and enjoy the ride really it's, it's good to have premier league football back yeah listen I, I if i told you what i was doing i was all about copper america I was all about CONCACAF. I was all about the Central Americans. I, it was like completely bonkers for me, Stinch. But we have like FA Cup then comes along. And it's now at the business end of the FA Cup because obviously you're one step closer to Wembley. So some of these teams, they're going to be fighting on like four fronts. Yeah, definitely. Um, probably just the big teams, really. I think there's only like sort of a few sort of uh, you know, United got knocked out of the cup, Arsenal got knocked out of the cup, um, Arsenal aren't in Europe, Man United have got Atletico Madrid, I think, in the next round of Champions League. Um, I would be surprised if they navigated themselves there. Um, but I have to say, since we were last on, there's been an awful lot happening kind of off the field in terms of managerial changes, transfer changes. Roy Hodgson's come on board at, at Watford, did a very good job at Crystal Palace in, the, I think, four seasons he was there. He, he get them, guided them quite safely to sort of mid-table finishes, never really ever in relegation trouble. Uh, and then his first game for Watford Saturday night, he got a clean sheet away at Burnley, Watford's first clean sheet of the season. And but as we all know, Burnley is not the easiest place to go, especially in, in the winter with the difficult weather conditions. Frank Lampard's turned up at Everton. Um, obviously, Aubameyang's left Arsenal, and I would say Arsenal, Man United and West Ham have all kind of stood still, really, in January, haven't really strengthened themselves. And then you look at the bottom, Norwich haven't brought anybody in, whereas Burnley and Newcastle have both been quite active. So, yeah, lots, lots have happened, really. So, uh, it'd be good to kind of uh, uh, discuss it a bit more in depth as we uh, enter each of the games. 
Okay, so make sure you get yourselves in the chat. Remember, you are the third guest. Now, this is the way it's going to work. I'm going to do the records, then we're going to do the games. Then we're going to have a Q&A at the end for you to uh, ask your questions to the boys, the experts. Then I will give the official pick. So make sure you save your questions. I don't mind like the odd question coming in about the game that we're actually covering. But then at the end, when you have your turn, don't be shy. Don't be like them kids at school that you talk all the way through the class. And then when I ask if there's any questions, you all go quiet because that is your time. OK, let's have a little look at the said records because obviously much to talk about it uh, as you can see we're uh, we're doing all right and if anybody's trying to add them up and they don't add up it's because we don't duplicate so if i have a plus 100 mark has a plus 100 on the same game we don't add 200 to the uh the table and the total it because obviously it's only one unit the team only wins one but they do go on to the individuals right so mark and stinch it is time and oh, by the way I, do i owe you anything on them or have i sorted it out now all good mind, I think. Right, Stinch? Yeah, I think accurate. Just need to change the negative to a positive now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You've got plenty of time. Plenty of time at all. As I told you before, one, one season in the start of March, I was down 32 units and I ended up 16 units in profit. So listen, but let's let's not test it again, eh? Let's try and do it a little bit earlier. Yeah, I mean, I, so, I, I think it's worth maybe just touching on it to be transparent. You know, um, I said, I think I said to you before, I'm very happy with the bets I've, I've taken. To be honest, and I would still take them yeah. again. They, I just feel some of them. Well, no, that's silly if you take them again because you already know that they lost. <laughs> I mean, if you know, if the <laughs> if the fixtures were played again later on in the season, to be fair, I would take them again. Um, I just feel like a bit a bit of bad luck. I mean, I think I've had six or seven voids on games yeah. where I felt as though I was in a very strong position in play. Um, yeah, so not, I say I'm not trying to make excuses. I'm just trying to be um, transparent and say, yeah, I would continue to, to, to take the same bets and the same process. No, that's it. You've got to stick with the process. You can't start like dodging and going against because you go against everything. And if you like, it's almost like you're driving along the road and all of a sudden there's cars in front of you. You just got to get in the and wait for that opening. If you start ducking and diving, you're asking for trouble. OK, by the way, Marco, hey, you look about 22 today. What's going on? Like You look like I've got Marco, <laughs> his younger brother with me. Just had a, had a shave at the weekend. Just, <laughs> that's like, it. Yeah. The missus has been like giving you a bit of hammer, has she? Oh, just a bit, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In my ear, the whole international break. All right, well, let's kick straight on then. Let's go with this first game because the first game is a bit of a tricky one. But if you're a home side, because it's Burnley versus Manchester United. Burnley at massive plus 525. And you can get them at plus one, at minus 115. Man United at minus 175 away from home. I'm not too sure I'd want to be anywhere near that. The draw is an interesting runner at plus 320. And the under or over is at two and a half, with the under being at plus money. Mark O'Hare, uh, first of all, I don't see three goals in this game. No, I don't either. Um, I think it could be a bit of a stinker. Um, I watched Burnley's match at the weekend against Watford. Really intrigued to see that. You know, a big six-pointer at the bottom of the table, Rui Hodgson's first game. Really intrigued to see how uh, Weghorst would uh, fare alongside Maxwell Cornet in quite an exciting partnership up front for Burnley but uh, yeah it was not a lot to, to really say about the match it was dreadful and um, yeah I think Wakehorse and Cornet will get better as, as the season progresses what, and their understanding. What did you make of them early on? Do you think that they will cause problems? Yeah I think they will I really like Wakehorse I think that's an, actually an upgrade on, on Chris Wood I think they've got a tremendous deal there we've seen already how influential Maxwell Cornet can be when he's fit and firing and, and given the freedom to, to play to his best of ability so yeah I think they can combine it and be good to, um, you know probably further down the track because they look like they've obviously never trained together, let alone played together at the weekend. So we'll see how they go. Um, they were the first team to fail to score against Watford all season and Watford did have the better of the opportunities. Poor game though. And look, Burnley have only won once all season. They're rock bottom, scored twice in seven games. It was also their fourth nil-nil in seven matches now in the Premier League. So we know about their issues in front of goal, but what they still are is a dogged team, a resilient team, an organised team, which is difficult to beat. And I know they've played fewer games than most in the bottom half. They've got the best defence in terms of goals conceded. And only Southampton have lost fewer games in the bottom half as well. So six of their defeats have come away from home. We know, as Stinch suggested at Turf Moor, if the conditions are windy, blustery and, and a bit rainy, then it can be really difficult for opposition teams. So there's no way I'd want United on side at those kind of cramped odds at all. So um, embarrassed on Friday night against Middlesbrough, despite it going to penalties. And I just think Ralph Ragnick's not getting the 
respect he probably needs uh, in or out of the dressing room right now. So they're a muddled group at the moment, United, and you know results have actually been pretty decent since uh, the Watford debacle and Solskjaer's departure. Six wins, three draws, just the one defeat in the Premier League, but they do not look fluent in the final third. And if you look at their away performances so far this season, the only two matches in which they've really kind of stamped their authority on the opposition were Spurs before Nuno sacking and then Brentford, who are in a right pickle at the moment themselves. So, yeah, well, that was I look a draw at, at half time, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, All the goals it was, came yeah. in the second half there. Yeah, but I just look at United's performances against teams down there at the bottom. Norwich, Newcastle and Watford, all just wretched, just absolutely stunk the place out. So, yeah, I'm not expecting Burnley to go gung-ho here. I think they'll be quite happy to sort of play a patient, probing, uh, counter-attack, set-piece approach. So it all kind of beds itself into a, an unders match, doesn't it? So uh, I'd probably prefer under two and three quarters, uh, if I could, uh, at a nicer price, just to get... You know, if it is a three-goal game, you'd still get a kind of half of your stake back, but uh, I wouldn't put anyone off back in unders either. Stinch, it's got to be unders, and it? Man United are absolutely stinking. Burnley, I'm not too sure that they're going to be able to... If you've got Maguire, Lindroff, or any of them, like, big centre-halves, they're going to want to play against the Burnley-type strikers. So is this not a game that just cancels out? I'll tell you what I am liking. What about Man United not to score twice at plus one one five? Yeah, I tell you what, under Ralph Ranick's 11 games in charge, only three times they've scored two or more goals. And that's incredible, really, when you consider they've, they've faced Newcastle, they've faced Norwich, they've played Burnley at home, they've played, that includes Middlesbrough in the Cup, young boys in the Champions League, uh, Crystal Palace. You know, it's not like they've been playing the elite of the elite United. They just, they just don't look fluid at all, I think, as Mark alluded to. I think he, he made it... Um, spot on when he says Ralph Rangnick's not getting the respect I think he summed up quite well um, you know he he left Jesse Lingard out of the, the squad for Middlesbrough because uh, he, he said his uh, head wasn't in the right place and then even if it even if that wasn't the truth you don't want your you don't want them want your player going on social media and sending a message to say he is available you know it just just it, you know you shouldn't be disrespecting the guy in charge I mean you'll, you'll know all about that as a Premier League player when you flash you know the manager you know it, you got all be working harmoniously together to to get the success that they need. And to be fair, as I said, in January they've 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 lost. Uh, I mean, they lost Martial, loaned him out to Sevilla. They lost Van der Beek, loaned him out to Everton. Diallo's gone to Rangers. Sancho got injured Friday night, and we know the issues regarding Mason Greenwood. And they haven't brought in any replacements. So if the likes of Ronaldo, Cavani, Fernandez, and Rashford aren't firing. There's no one else there that's looking, you know, that they can bring off the bench or, or you know, do something different. You know, go for a plan B or even a plan C. So the Burnley value at five twenty-five. Yeah, I was really tempted to try and get Burnley on side in in some way. Um, plus one. So I, yeah, I was looking at plus one, even or even Burnley double chance at plus one fifty. Um, but I just decided that you know United at the end of the day do possess Ronaldo, do possess. Uh, Cavani, Rashford, Fernandez, it can score about, out of absolutely nowhere. But because of United's struggles in terms of actually scoring goals, I just thought I'm kind of getting United on side if I do take the unders. So, yeah, I'm going for the under 2.75. Um, again, it's decision process. Like, for example, Everton v Villa, we talked about uh, before the international break. I wanted to get Villa on side. I could have backed Villa to win. I could have backed Villa draw no bet. I went with Villa over 1.5 goals. And the bet I chose, lost. But all the decision process was completely correct. So I hope and I've done, done the right thing this time around. I mean, I've got, you know, I've got 1-0, 2-0, 2-1 either side. I've got 0-0. I've got seven scores on my side. If it does finish with three goals, still get half my state back. And yeah, as I say, with United struggling going forward, we know how Burnley will set up. Actually, if you look at Burnley's results against the big teams this season, really, really impressive. They only lost 2-0 against both City and Liverpool. They went to Stamford Bridge and drew 1-1. Against Arsenal, they drew 0-0 there. And then at home uh, against some of these teams, they haven't, they haven't played all of them yet. They're still to come. But they only lost 1-0 at home to Arsenal and they drew 0-0 with West Ham. So against the better teams, arguably Burnley uh, are even more difficult to break down because I don't think, I don't think they even... Off, they don't. They're not. They don't play expansive. I think they know. They know against the teams lower down. They need to attack at some point because it's crucial to try and. If they pick up points, that means the other teams aren't picking up. So, yeah, I'm expecting just a real tight, uh, a tight, difficult game. And um, as I said in uh, in on Saturday night against Watford, the weather definitely played a part. And uh, yeah, if it's still if it's still like that, uh, I foresee a, a very low. Do we know game. what the weather's going to be like here this midweek? 
I wouldn't like to predict the weather because I think weathermen <laughs> have got the best job in the world, whereas they can be wrong and you know still still uh, still get paid. So well, it doesn't matter what the weather is. We'll see some players with gloves on. Um, <laughs> it's plus one twenty for the draw half time. Yeah, I mean, draw. If you're back in draws, generally you'll think it'll be a low scoring game. So I guess the only issue there is if someone creeps into a, a slender one nil lead. But uh, yeah, it's all about what you approach you prefer to take. If if you if you do like back in draws, then um, yeah, go for draws. But if you prefer to back back low uh, back unders, I would I would take the unders. But they both kind of you know match up with each other. You know, if you're back in a draw, you're seeing zero goals or maybe two goals. You know, so that's two out yeah. of the three that you've got covered. So. Um, yeah, I think it's just all about personal preference, really, because the, the prices uh, are all correlated. OK, well, let's have a little look at the official picks of our first game. It's Burnley versus Manchester United. Uh, myself and Marco here have uh, just kept well away because we think the Man United stink, to be honest. And uh, under two and a half stroke three, which is under 2.75 goals at one, minus 135. Can go with the draw half time at plus 120. Man United not to score twice at plus 115. But we see this as a very, very tight game. Wouldn't be surprised if Man United do win one or two nil. Sam, the weatherman in the chat, saying it's light rain and nine degrees tomorrow. Is that like nine degrees as in like 33 or 34 degrees? Or is that Celsius, uh, Sam? Don't give me half a story. Let's move on. <laughs> To the second game because I like this one for goals and I think there's value everywhere you look if you look in the right places. Man City versus Brentford. Man City minus 900. Whoop, whoop. Uh, Brentford at plus 2200 could be double for me. Under or over three and a half goals. I see over at minus 105. The draw, forget it, is plus 900. Now then, I'm going to come to you first, Inch, because I see Man City scoring minimum four or five. So if I'm seeing them score four or five, I'm going over three and a half at minus 105. But the Man City to win by three at minus 110, I see there's an easy being a 3-0, 4-0, 5-0, maybe even 5-1. Yeah, Brentford have been... I've been really disappointed with Brentford over the last few months. I think there are mitigating circumstances for them. They've been missing their goalkeeper who was ruled out for three months or maybe a bit longer. Uh, although he was back against Everton at the weekend, but they still managed to ship four again. So maybe you shouldn't read too much into his uh, return. But they were, you know, they're missing a number of players in the defensive positions. And they're another team that haven't really strengthened. They signed Christian Eriksen, but I wouldn't imagine he's going to be um, straight into action. So, yeah, um, I think it, it makes sense to try and oppose Brentford. And, and we all know what Man City are capable of doing going forward, don't we? Capable of scoring you know, five, six, seven uh, easily. I mean, Brentford have conceded two or more goals in the last seven away games. So, again, it all, as you're right, it all kind of points to a big Man City win. It's just how we go about that, I suppose. Um, I was looking. I was again. I was looking at um, Man City first half just to just to throw something out else out there. Uh, Man City minus one first half minus one twenty. Um, wow, I that's decent. You, I don't know if you remember. Um, just after Christmas, we all kind of jumped on the Man City first half bandwagon away at Brentford, and um, unfortunately, they only went into half one nil up. But you know, as I say that that's still money back. It finished one nil as well. It absolutely killed me, Stinch. But in that game, they didn't play with any. Uh, listen, Grealish, I wouldn't. He wouldn't be like a relegation fodder. He shouldn't be in like a, a proper team, or especially away from home. At home, then it might be a different story. But that was a the problem. There was personnel. They were like just mishmash. Yeah, I think the other thing it's uh, maybe lends itself to to Man City is Brentford do like to play football when when they can, um, rather than uh, a team that's going to sit back and defend deep. So that arguably aids Man City's chances of finding space to to create chances to score goals. And uh, crucially, they I, I think other than Gabriel Jesus, not really had too many players notably away. I, I think Edison probably was away, but I know he didn't play. Um, so yeah, I think Man City have, have probably been great for Pep. Really, you know how much work he does on the training ground. Um, they had they played Fulham at the weekend, comfortably one four one, and and you think Fulham are kind of a similar level really to to Brentford. Uh, you know, absolutely flying in the Championship at the moment. Um, they've been scoring sixes and se- uh, sixes on a regular basis of, of late. So yeah, trying to get Man City on side. So it's, it's uh, trying to find that best way, and I think. Probably right. The handicap is is the way to go because um, the other the other bet, especially the total goals, you're kind of re- relying on maybe the Brentford contributing. And um, yeah, really going forward, Brentford have been quite blunt of late, um, heavily relying on uh, 
well, Tony, but uh, other than penalties, he's not really been contributing in front of goal much this season. Uh, Brian and Buemo, he didn't play at the weekend either. I'm not sure about his availability. So, yeah, trying to get City on side somehow. But again, I always had the caveat in. It's like, if you want the bet to pay, it's it's kind of what, do how much motivation City want to win this by three or four goals. You know, have they got their sights set on weekend or Champions League next week? with the games coming up thick and fast. Uh, maybe Guardiola will be happy to go 2-0 up, and then in 60 minutes he'll start taking some of his best players off. Um, although we know the players coming on are still of high quality. So, yeah, yeah. I would just if, you, if you've got a way to bat Man City or if you've got a preferred way to bat Man City, whether that be handicap, whether that be team goals, whether that even be backing them to win to nil, although that was quite short when I looked at it uh, yesterday, I think it was like minus 150. Um, I would just continue down, down the, your sort of preferred route. How about Man City? Over one and a half goals. First half uh, between plus 135 and one plus 145. The man, just team total. Man City scored twice, Mark O'Hare, in the first half at home to the cannon fodder. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the more appealing plays for this game for me. Um, personally, I think when the market makes a team about a 90% chance to win, it's, it's kind of one just to leave alone, to be honest. I think the handicap is is big enough and I don't really like the idea of kind of going into a game needing a team to win by three or more goals to, to sort of get my profit. So um, City have been playing obviously in terms of results, 14 wins from 16 in the Premier League. But I, I don't know, I think, I don't think they've been as good as we probably expect them to be recently. Um, you know, ignore the FA Cup, but since Boxing Day, they've been held at Southampton, beat Chelsea fair enough. I thought they were pretty, pretty played pretty well that game, but they struggled past Arsenal and Brentford as well. Uh, now, I guess the caveat is three of those fixtures were all on the road and that the Etihad, they're a different yeah. beast. But I know I, I looked at the underlying process and they're averaging 1.4 expected goals more than their opponents on a per game basis at the, uh, sorry, 1.67 at the Etihad. But if you look at their goal difference, it equates to about 2.36 goals per game. Um, so there's a bit of a chasm there between what they're actually creating and converting or what they're conceding and what they're sort of uh, stopping their opponents from doing so. So, yeah, there's a few sort of uh, red flags in there for me just to kind of walk away from this game. But as you say, Brentford are in a bit of a hole at the moment. It's eight defeats and ten, considered twice or more in their last seven away, beaten by three at Liverpool, which is normally a, a decent gauge. But I thought they competed reasonably well at Anfield for, for 45 minutes before imploding. So, Fash, you've nailed Man City throughout the season, you know, when they've won, when they've won, <laughs> won convincingly yeah, I'm, I'm, and also I'm when adding. they started I'm, against you're Southampton. You're talking and I'm adding... I, I've just put. I've just found. I mean, someone said plus one forty-five. I think. I think Man City scored twice. And, I, and listen, I wouldn't be surprised if, if I, I cop with my first two two goals in the first half, and maybe not cop with my minus two and a half. But I, I just think it's a free hit. I, I, so I see them scoring twice in the first twenty minutes. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna deny that. I think City will win this game comfortably. It's just. It's just not one for me. So absolutely, okay. fill your boots. Yeah, I am filling my boots. I am, uh, I am absolutely filling my boots. Uh, everyone in the chat, they all seem to be loving Jonathan Nelson saying Man City first half minus one. What are you doing, Jonathan? What price is that? Because for them to win a minus one, you've got to have team total of over 1.5. And I know that minus one is what is it's got to be minus, minus one. one. Plus one. It's minus 120 because I had a right. Jonathan, a let, OK, let me just take Jonathan to school for a second. OK, Jonathan, I understand that you know you're betting, you love your betting. But for you to get a winner at minus one, you've got to score two. If you're getting plus 140 for team total over 1.5, then you've got to take it. Even if it doesn't come up your way, you've got to take 140 over minus 125, minus 130. OK. So jump on my wagon. Come on, I'll carry you. Uh, official bet, Man City versus Brentford. I see Man City scoring four or five here. And as long as they score two in the first half, me, myself, Jonathan, and the rest of the people in the chat are going to be very happy. Man City minus two at minus 110. I see them scoring, um, winning by three goals. And I see them scoring two in the first half. So over 1.5 in the first half. I've just took uh, plus 135 because I haven't got time to be scouting around like you lot have. I've got to be giving you a price. So it's plus 135. Let's move on to game three. Because I was surprised, dear Stinch, that you didn't get involved. It's Norwich versus Palace before I give you the money line. Uh, Palace at plus 180, not to score. That's always the first port of call. Do we think that's value? Norwich at plus 250 to win the game. Palace at plus 115. Palace far stronger. Uh, I think this is a great matchup for the visitors, as 
It's always a great matchup. Whenever you play Norwich normally, draw is at plus 240. The under or over at two and a half. I wouldn't put anyone off of the uh, the over here as well. And that's at plus 115. Mark O'Hare, I see Palace too big, too strong and too sharp for this Norwich side. Yeah, uh, I think this is a bit of an banana skin, to be honest. Um, I think on the surface, I was quite interested in getting Palace on side with a quarter goal deficit rather than the, the full-on win, which I still think is a reasonable price and a bet. You know, allows you to lose just half of your stake if the game ends in a draw, which I think there's a, a high potential for, for this match to end in a stalemate. Um, so I'm taking a watching brief because I just don't think Palace win often enough to justify the risk. Um, we've showered them with loads and loads of praise all season. Patrick Vieira has been given a, you know, a lot of sort of pats on the back for the work he's done and the transfer business that they did in the summer as well. You know, I held my hands up and I, I never expected Palace to be quite as good as they have been under Vieira, considering what he did in his previous roles, but. You know, if you take a step back, they still only won five Premier League games in 22 attempts, which, you know, when you associate uh, all those kind of positive, you know, talk that we've had around Palace, it's not quite been good enough. And they've drawn nine times. So that's why I think it's a big runner. And what I found quite fascinating, really, is Palace's record against teams outside of the top eight. Two wins, seven draws, two defeats. So basically wow. two wins from 11 against the weakest section of the division. Uh, one of those was obviously against Norwich at Selhurst Park, but Norwich had a real scratch team out that day. Fans were suggesting it was the, the worst team they've ever played. Um, so 82%, 82% non-defeats for Norwich. Yeah, and you compare it, Palace, Palace's record there to Norwich's record against the teams outside the top eight. Four wins, two yeah. draws and six defeats. So basically Norwich are winning more often and winning more points than Palace against the worst teams in the division, which is yeah. a bit of a surprise really. And they also come into this match having won four of the last five uh, including the FA Cup, beating Wolves to nil at the weekend. A huge 3-0 victory against Watford last time out in the Premier League. A newfound belief. I think Dean Smith you know, had sort of taught, touched on it a few times during the losing run, but they weren't too far away. And, and kind of on occasion, we watched their match against Man United and thought, there's something in this for Norwich. And then sort of a week later, they capitulate. So yeah. ugh, I'm just finding them so hard to second guess at the moment. And because Palace have only won five Premier League games all season, I just can't push the button. So I just thought I'd leave it alone and let someone else have a crack at it. Stinch, maybe you'll give me a little bit of confidence because I've got Palace too strong, too quick. And with Norwich being a little bit confident, they're going to leave the back door and especially the wings open. And that's exactly where Palace's strengths are. Yeah, I think maybe if you ignore everything that's happened this season and just look at these two in a, in a one-off match, then yeah, you'd want to get with Palace. But I think Mark's right. There's kind of a enough red flags to to be wary, shall we shall we say. I mean, uh, Mark mentioned about the fact Palace have won just five games all season. They failed to win eleven of the last twelve matches away from home. And we we talk about home and away quite a lot and and the it's nearly worth about half a goal home advantage in, in England. And we know the fans at Palace are always very loud, very vocal. I mean that that last game before the international break when they played Liverpool, they absolutely played off the park the first half an hour. But then the last hour it, it looked like Palace, if anything, were were the better team. Um so yeah, like away from home they're they're obviously a different a different beast. And in terms of the the sort of staple diet of the clean sheet. It's just one clean sheet in the last 11 for Palace, and that was the reverse fixture. But as Mark mentioned, some Norwich fans were listing the Norwich side as the worst ever team in the Premier League put out that day um, because of uh, injuries and illness. So, yeah, massive. Uh, I mean, we, we talked about it's very similar price to when Everton went there a few weeks ago. And, uh, you know, we all talked about Everton's price and we none of us really wanted to go near Everton at the price and I'm not suggesting Palace were are as bad as Everton but you know Mark's right the stats simply say that Palace aren't winning enough games at the odds and and that and that's a great example that he gives when they're playing the bottom half teams that maybe they're not giving these teams enough respect you know when they play the top teams maybe they are trying harder maybe they are um, you know, taking on board, you know, Patrick Vieira was, uh, he played for all the big clubs in his career. You know, maybe he gets them up more for the, the bigger games. So, yeah, I, I, don't get me wrong, if you look, if you looked at this blindly uh, and you saw that obviously Norwich near, <clears throat> nearly rooted to the bottom, hardly scored any goals all the season and you're getting a team at plus money, then, uh, then, 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 yeah, on paper, it's probably a knocking bet. But yeah, I just think there's enough reasons 
enough evidence surrounding it that it's uh, it's 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 a bit there's some risk attached. But uh, you know that's that's what betting is all about at the end of the day. And and you wouldn't be interested if it was sort of minus one ten. So the fact that they're plus plus one fifteen is maybe why you feel it's uh, value. So uh, yeah, what price yeah, would and, you make? And for them to score twice. I mean, that was the other one, and I've made maybe a 2-2 draw, and I'm still going to pick up at plus 125 for Palace to score twice. But I, the biggest red flag I've seen and heard of since we started, like Norwich versus Crystal Palace, was that you have not gone anywhere near the plus 180 on Norwich not to score. So, I mean, that's my, that's my biggest red flag. But well, listen, I wouldn't put anyone off of Palace scoring twice and not worry about what the score is. At plus 125, over 1.5 goals for Palace because Norwich ain't keeping no clean sheets. I know they did in the FA Cup, but the FA Cup this week was full of traps and horrendous performances. And we'll come on to one of them very, very shortly. Official picks here. I'm not dodging this one. I'm going to take Palace. I think they're far too strong, far too pacey. Um, and midfield, I think they're just going to completely dominate. Palace, money line at uh, plus 115. Yep, sign me up. It was close to being my banker, by the way, just to give me a little bit more. Well, I'm just digging a bigger hole, really. Am I going to be jumping around or you're going to be throwing mud all over me? OK, so, yeah, it's the away team for me. Let's uh, move now to North London because it's definitely not the away side, this one. It's Spurs versus Southampton. Uh, Tottenham at minus 170. Uh, not for me, thank you. Minus one at plus 110. That is interesting. Southampton at plus 460. Not a great uh, record uh, at Tottenham. Under over two and a half goals with the over being at minus 135. The draw is at 315 plus 315. Southampton not to score is plus 155. Marco here. Yeah, I mean, Saints have, have been good for a goal recently. I think they scored an eight of the last nine Premier League games. So they're not too bad going forward. It's defensively where they've got issues, uh, particularly on the road. I'm sure I read a stat. I don't have it to hand. But since the start of last season, Southampton have conceded by far and away the most goals away from home in the Premier League. And it's, it's by some distance as well. So that's my concern about Southampton coming into this bit, this match. Um, they do tend to toil on their travels, six defeats on the road, and they've considered twice or more in nine of 11 away days, which is remarkable considering they managed a nil-nil draw at the Etihad earlier in the season. So how they manage that, I don't know, compared to those stats and trends. But they are shipping goals. They're giving away chances without a clean sheet since November's international break. Uh, Lianco and Brojo were forced off at the weekend and looked to be probably missing this this midweek as well. Um, and look, this match was played you know, not so long ago, uh, late December. And Saints were really fortunate to come away with a draw at St Mary's. Spurs had two second half goals disallowed. Um, and yeah, I think Tottenham are trending in the right direction. I, I probably expected too much too soon from Conte and Spurs, but I do think they are the favourites for the top four at the moment. And I think they are treading in the right direction. I think after what we saw Thomas Tuchel achieve overnight with Chelsea, I probably imagined Conte would be able to do something similar with Spurs. But you look at um, their performances, they're definitely moving in the right way. Uh, to score three goals against Brighton is no easy feat, even if it is the FA Cup. Uh, I thought they were absolutely ex outstanding away at Leicester and they, they needed the win late on, but still fully deserved the points there. And, you know, if you take out the performances against Chelsea, who do tend to be their kryptonite, they've been very convincing for quite some time now. And I think the January business was was superb. I think Benton Core slots in there wonderfully well. Kulazewski's really sort of adaptable, versatile and offers something very different. Yeah. And Harry Kane is in form and scoring goals and just having more attempts at goal, which always helps. So, yeah, he's enjoying his football. Spurs seem to be too, doing that as well. And their record against teams below them in the Premier League this season, 10 wins, two draws, just the one defeat. At home, six wins from six against teams below them. I think they'll be too, too strong for Saints. So, yeah, I think it, there's a, numerous ways you can look at it, uh, which way you want to go. Uh, I personally was looking at Spurs to win and over one and a half goals at minus 120, but... I've just taken a slightly shorter price on Spurs, minus three quarters, uh, minus 130. Uh, it just means I get a half stakes win if Spurs win by exactly one goal. Covers the one nil. Uh, I get a full stakes win if Spurs win by two or more goals, uh, which could be anything really. And I think you're sort of coming from a similar angle too, Flash. Yeah, I am. I am. I, I think that Tottenham will score goals against this Southampton. So, yeah, Southampton are always going to be uh, a big threat from set pieces. But the defenders, they mark space. And I, I've been saying for years about marking space. I've never seen space score a goal. Mark the person in the box. And the thing is now with Spurs is their belief is growing. I don't love Spurs at the moment, but I certainly feel as if they're going to be too strong for Southampton. Um, Stinch, when we look at some of these numbers, though, I maybe feel as if I've overcomplicated this because I, I'm happy. I've, I wrote Spurs to win 3-1. The minus 135 
over two and a half goals just doesn't complicate it. But I'm getting minus 150 for Tottenham to score twice. So minus one at plus 110 is a free hit. Yeah, yeah, potentially. I mean, you, I think you know Southampton better than all of us and probably watch them, watch more of their games than us. So uh, happy to uh, to lean on your inside knowledge, really. But I think Southampton is, is uh, as Mark kind of alluded to, pretty much a broken record away from home. Um, I mean, I think it's worth definitely worth congratulating yourself on the, I think it was the last game for the national break when they went to Wolves. Really got really low goal line. Wolves were, I think, plus plus one forty or plus one thirty. And I think you bat Wolves. You bat Wolves score over one point five goals, and they won three one. Um, you know. Oh yeah, but don't listen, listen, listen. Let me tell you now. Southampton were by far the better team that day. I was for forty minutes of that first half. Southampton's best performance. I tweeted it where going. This is Southampton's best performance of the season. Yeah, I think uh, Wolves went in one nil up or something like that. But Southampton were frighteningly good and I'm looking going, I'm on the wrong side here. But yeah, it worked out and, um, and listen, I'll tell you how lucky I was that day. Traore scored. Do you know what I mean? In like the 93rd minute to make it look 3-1 in the 93rd minute, it totally glossed over how good Southampton were. But against this side, my only downside with this minus one is if, if they're winning 2-1, do they shut up shop and just make sure they get the three points? Yeah, I mean, having said that, Conte has had I'm not sure how many how many games. I know he's only been at Spurs ten about ten or twelve games, but about nine of those have been against bottom half teams. And Spurs have been very good in the underlying data. They've been uh, averaging around about two expected goals per game. And when you've got players like Harry Kane that are capable of scoring difficult chances, that two expected goals can easily become three. And Mark mentioned about Southampton's woes um, away from home. 14 of the last 16 games, they've conceded at least two or more goals. So again, that 0-0 that at the Etihad is just, an, you know, just an, 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 a mad anomaly again. Um, and also, uh, I've been very impressed with Broha this, this season. I feel like if he's not scoring or Ward-Prowse is not scoring from a free kick or creating a chance from a dead ball situation, then maybe Southampton, I've mentioned it a few times, I think maybe Southampton not got somebody they can rely on for goals if, if neither of those two are, are firing. And yeah, I'm not a big fan of Lianco at the back either. Uh, he's come from no. uh, Torino. No, he's not half as good as he thinks he is. Yeah, he's come from Torino and Syria, and we know how goal-heavy Syria is, and Torino regularly involved in, in high-scoring games. So, yeah, very happy to, to side with Spurs. I guess just maybe would be concerned if uh, Son's back. I'm not sure if he's available, but as Mark says, Carrie Kane seems to have finally found his form again. And with the you know, with the addition of Kulusevski, uh, Bergwijn was obviously imperative in the victory at Leicester. Uh, he's still got Lucas Moura as well, capable of contributing. So, yeah, I just thought um, Spurs to win was a bit short. Spurs over 1.5 goals. Team goals was a bit short. But I really like, yeah. actually, the bet that Mark proposed there. Spurs to win and, and them to score over one. Sorry, Spurs to win and over 1.5 goals in the game at minus 120. So you're just increasing that minus 150 to minus 120. And you'll pick up as long as Spurs don't win by the, the single goal. And given Southampton's defensive statistics, you wouldn't expect it to finish 1-0 Spurs. No, you must get a great price and it might be great value. If you went with Spurs to win and both teams to score, you're probably going to be looking at like plus 245 or something like that. So maybe because so I'm just scoring nearly every game. It's just the other team score more. So listen, official pick. So if you haven't got an official pick, it's not worth it. So everyone in the chat. Oh, by the way, Kishori says he wants to go over nine corners. Yeah, I think nine's low enough for you to uh, go and enjoy because Southampton don't sit back. They have a go as well. They'll contribute four or five corners. Uh, Tottenham, so that's basically minus 0.75 goals at minus 130. I've just gone top of the minus one at plus 110. I see this, baby. I wrote down 3 1, so I tried to work around that. Uh, and Stinch quite likes the uh, Tottenham to win and over one and a half goals. I think it was like minus 120. So let's it's move on. Plus 225 flash for Tottenham to win and both teams to score. Yeah, there you go. I mean, that, that, that seems like a realistic. Um, Brings in that 2 1 as well, doesn't it? That very smelly 2 1 where Mark O'Hare gets half his dough back and I lose the lot. So, uh, <laughs> and then you get your money back as well. Oh, yeah, of course, because it's a free hit, obviously. Yeah, so that's that's the way I go with the uh, minus one. Okay, let's move on. 
because this is a really, really strange game. It's Aston Villa versus Leeds. Aston Villa minus 120, Leeds plus 310. Leeds draw double chance at plus 100. This is a really, really tough game to pick. The draw at plus 290 could well be a runner. I'm not sure we see over three goals, though. That's why it's a plus 115. Stinch, give me some numbers because Villa leads. I'm thinking that Leeds could be dangerous, but I couldn't I couldn't go against Villa at home. They've got to click sooner or later. Uh, well, I really like Villa. I discussed it a few times. Uh, back them away at Everton. Unfortunately, didn't get paid out, but uh, was on the right lines. Uh, big fan of Steven Gerrard and his management. Bit of a broken record for me, really. I'm still waiting for Bamford to come back for, for Leeds, and I still think he's going to miss this game. You mentioned the draw. It's really interesting to know that actually Villa are the team with the fewest draws in the league this season, yeah. just two out of 21 matches. So you can kind of see... They're sort of, you know, they either win or they lose. And uh, I'm not convinced by them defensively. Uh, you know, I think Tyro Mings, for example, encapsulates them quite well. Very good on the ball, but maybe not. He makes Harry best... Maguire look good. <laughs> maybe, not the, no, maybe not the best defensively. So, I, what I, I mean, it jumped out at me as soon as I looked to the game. I saw the goal line of three and I thought, oh, I wonder what both teams are scoring over 2.5 goals is. And it's plus 100. Now... Oh. In that, we only need to we only need three goals to win the bet. Whereas in the other bet, we need four to get paid out. Obviously, we get our money back if there's only three. But you know, when if you ever Mark made made a good point earlier, if you're going into a game and you're batting a team to win and they've got a handicap to clear of two, you know, already you might feel a bit nervous. So you go into a game and you back over three, and you might again you need four to get paid. Already you're feeling a bit nervous. But with these two teams, I say I think they're both very good going forward. But I I think both are still vulnerable defensively. And the numbers really back it up, to be honest. Uh, Villa had 13 of their matches go over 2.5 goals. 11 of them saw both teams to score. At Leeds had 12 that have gone over and 10 saw both teams to score. So you're not really taking too much of a risk by backing uh, over 2.5 and both teams to score. And worrying that either team keeps a clean sheet, in my opinion. You know, those two combined, you're looking at an 84% strike rate. At Villa Park, 70% of matches have seen both teams score and Leeds on the road have seen 70% of matches both teams score. So I just think this is a, this is a fantastic way to basically get, get goals on our side uh, when the goal line's pitched up at three without having to get involved with that sort of high goal line, if you like. And I think I think uh, it's very similar price as well. I think what was it plus one ten for over three, and uh, yeah, plus one hundred if you if you take away a goal and just throw both teams to score in. So we backed it when Leeds went to West Ham and it was in by half time. And I think similar something similar is uh, is on the cards uh, in this midweek clash. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't actually pick the winner, but I fancy we do see goals in the last twenty minutes, uh, Marco here. And, and the other thing I've got to update is it says there draw money line. Plus 290. I can tell you that BetUS have just moved the line. It's now plus 300. But if you wanted the draw after 75 minutes and not get done in the last 20, then it's plus 245. I'm so close to adding that. Plus 245 for it to be a draw after 74 minutes, 59 seconds. Give me my money and then go and get your third goal. I see this being 1-1 after 75 minutes, Marco here, or even 2-2. Yeah, I, I would expect goals. Um, I actually had the exactly the same, same bet as a uh, stinch uh, laid out. I, I've pulled back on it, though, um, because Patrick Bamford, I thought he might be back, but they've confirmed on Monday morning that he's missing and, and Bielsa seemed a bit disillusioned as to what the injury is and how long more he's going to be out for. He doesn't seem to be improving at all, which is quite concerning, really, from a Leeds perspective. And, you know, I was quite keen on them going into the game against Newcastle before the international break. And I thought they played really well on the back of what they achieved at West Ham. Dominated the match. Rafinha and Harrison played really well on the flanks. But it's just another example of how much they miss Bamford because Jack Dan James is a willing runner, but he's he's no Patrick Bamford leading that line. And, you know, Genia Firpo is, is still out. Calvin Phillips and Liam Cooper out as well. Foreshaw is at least expected back. So, um, yeah, they've just been so erratic leads, haven't they? So it's really hard to sort of nail them and, and know what they're going to be, uh, what, what sort of uh, performance they're going to put in in this kind of match. And I think Aston Villa are an interesting um, proposition coming into this match. Stephen Gerrard talked about using the 18 days between their last game and this as 
as basically an opportunity to have a mini pre-season. Uh, they beat Everton 1-0 before the break, but it was a, a backs-to-the-wall job, and they're now 11 points above the drop zone. So results and performances have been quite promising. Uh, well, actually, results is, is five wins, one draw, and four defeats under Gerrard, but three of the four defeats came against the top three. So uh, they've actually been pretty decent. They've scored in nine of their 10 games under him, and they've only leaked multiple goals uh, once to teams outside the top six. So, you know, there's there's improvements in both boxes under Gerrard, but, um, you know, Buendia is starting to get the best out of him in that sort of free role. Coutinho's looked much more confident and happy since his switch to from Barcelona, even playing for Brazil, he's looked all right. Um, and then you've got Callum Chambers as well, a new body, a bit of versatility in defence. So I do like Villa. I think the price is reasonable enough, but... Um, yeah, I think ultimately, if you're having a, a bet in this game, you want to be with goals. Uh, Villa have scored in 15 of the last 16 at home. Uh, they've scored twice or more in 8 of 12 against teams in 12th and below. Um, and then, yeah, I've talked about Leeds before, but uh, you know, away from home, they've scored in 7 of 10. And since promotion, 22 of 29 away games they've scored in. And 19 of those 29 saw over two and a half goals as well. But yeah, I, I just pulled back because of Bamford missing. And uh, I guess I was burned by the Leeds performance against Newcastle enough to sort of leave it alone. And I've got confidence in this Villa team too. So uh, I kind of balanced the two up and, and thought I'll, just, I'll, I'll let Stinch have it. Yeah, I'm going to leave it as well uh, because I, the more you talk about it, I wouldn't be surprised if Leeds were free one up at half time or something. But there, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if Villa were free one up. It's like, I think goals is the only way to go now, thinking about that. So I'm going to leave the plus 245 um, on the 75 minute mark. Uh, as for the draw anyway it's a draw after 75 minutes it's plus 245 now if it is a draw and I haven't done it I'll still be shouting and telling you I told you so but I'm not I'm not doing it so official picks only and they're the only ones that matter so for me and Mark it is a pull away because there's so many eventualities here so both teams are scoring over 2.5 at plus 100 let's cheer on Stinch and uh, make a little dent in that record of his so it's uh, both teams to score and over two and a half goals at plus 100 remember we did that West Ham versus Leeds and it was in after about 26 minutes okay let's move on to the next game because I've got plenty plenty to say if you're a Leicester fan then uh, cover your ears it's Liverpool versus Leicester Liverpool minus 335 Leicester plus 825 that tells you everything at the moment uh, under over three and a half goals well I'm not so sure about that because I fancy Liverpool could just strangle the life out of him I'm not interested in the draw plus 515 uh, team total they're telling you that Leicester are going to score as well Stinch your numbers I'm going to say, oh, OK, Leicester, they do well against big sides. They used to, they went to, obviously, um, the Etihad and they've won and had the best record. They then ship six. If I told you that in the last four away visits of Leicester, so Leicester's four away games, they've let in 16 goals. 16. That tells me that there's no coaching going on. And I think they're number one at letting in goals from set pieces. Again, no coaching. I think it's really difficult to put a finger on what's gone really wrong defensively. Well, defenders don't less. defend. But that's not something that they should just automatically stop doing if they've been doing it their whole playing career or at least for the season before at Leicester. So I think I've read that maybe Johnny Evans is the is the big miss because he's the organiser and the leader. But, you know, Kasper Schmeichel's still there behind them. He's obviously a very experienced player and, you know, got credentials in winning the Premier League, for example, um, very good international career as well. So, yeah, I don't really know what's what's gone wrong at Leicester, but in terms in terms of this game, um, I just thought a few of the, you know, we look at that minus three, four, five for Liverpool, you know, no way that we'd seen that price, uh, I think, last season, um, because that just goes to show how much turmoil Leicester in, really. I mean, Conceding four away at Forest in the you know in the Championship uh, in the FA Cup over the weekend and when it was like a first choice Leicester team and you know, Leicester went off uh, odds on they were I think they're about minus one ten they went off at um, yeah they were, you know, were at plus one fifteen they were my banker of the weekend Stinch I'm happy to get as many custard pies thrown at me they dominated for twenty minutes right against the wind all of a sudden their defence was a calamitous. They went 1-0 down. They were 3-0 down in like seven minutes. People weren't tracking. They lost all their discipline. And yet going forward, Barnes, Madison, they've got Daka, Iheanacho. They've got Tillemans. They've got Vardy. But at the back, they're just all over the shop. Yeah, and, and I think that brings us quite 
brings us nicely back to the odds because the goal line set three and a half. Liverpool's team total set two and a half. Yet yeah, Liverpool handicaps one and a half, and they're all very similar prices. So I think if you if you want to get involved in this bet in this game, I think Liverpool minus one and a half is is the way to go. Uh, just slightly odds on. Salah, I think, will probably be back. Not sure about Mane, but given the fact that Jota's in great form, uh, signed Luis Diaz, Javi Elliott's come back, Thiago's back. Don't think there's any real massive misses for Liverpool, and I think they'll be licking their lips uh, at this uh, this Leicester defence. Um, we, you know, we all know how strong Liverpool have been at Anfield. I think the I think they're unbeaten. It's something like 33 of the last 34 games or something. We know what the crowd's like on a midweek night. They'll be fully up for it. This game's on Thursday as well, so um, both teams played on Sunday, so both have had like a you know a decent amount of rest. So I would I would be surprised to you know if we saw a repeat basically what happened at Christmas because I think we're all very keen on on a Liverpool win and goals when they met just after Christmas and Leicester scraped that one 0 win didn't they with uh, you know Salah missing a penalty and Casper Schmeichel having a worldy game so I wouldn't expect the same outcome but you know you never know in football but look at playing just trying to play the odds as you know that's our job here Liverpool on the handicap. Is I feel like you're stealing at least a goal compared to the goal line and Liverpool's team total. Yeah, and the, and the only thing I, I I want to be with Liverpool all the way here, Marco here, yeah? and I'm looking at all the numbers and I'm thinking Liverpool must crush these. But after such a bad performance from Leicester, I think Rodgers is like, like uh, breathing through a straw at the moment. I think he <laughs> is definitely on his way out because people say, oh, they won the cup last year. Yeah, they did, but there's they're papering over so many cracks. Um, I want Liverpool to go and really do a number on them. But I'm also thinking, oh, are Liverpool going to go and put three or four in? Uh, I think there's definitely going to be motivation from the Liverpool side because of the match that Stinch talked about after Christmas where they dominated the KP, lost 1-0 to Leicester's only shot on target. And uh, I think that was a very much patched up Leicester team as it will be in midweek defensively. And you talk about Brendan Rodgers, he went to town on his team after the Forest defeat. He was said he was embarrassed and he was really brutal about some of his comments towards his players. I think for the first time this season, he's really kind of unloaded on his team, but he's the one who keeps picking the same players. And you look at the back four that fielded against Forrest, James Justin, who's been injured for most of the season, Amate, Sionchu and Thomas. You know, how are they going to contain Liverpool's front line, regardless of whether Salah and Mane play? And I do think Salah will play in this match. So quite a scary prospect for a Liverpool, for a Leicester team coming into this match who, yeah, their standards have dropped dramatically in the last, since the last two seasons. Um, it's quite a harrowing number of, of kind of numbers compared to their season so far. I've got them 16th on expected points, 16th on expected goals ratio. Only Newcastle are allowing more expected goals. They've conceded the most shots on target, the second most shots in the box, and the second most shots from anywhere, basically, which is appalling for a team who have got sort of top six, top four ambitions. So, yeah, I mean, Liverpool haven't been quite at their best against the best teams in the division so far this season, but this is a great opportunity for them to sort of kickstart their sort of title challenge again, really, after Southampton held Man City before the break. There still is an opportunity for them. So, yeah, I looked at all the odds. You've got over three and a half goals, at odds on quotes. You've got Liverpool with a quite a decent handicap to overcome as well. The total goal expectancy is around 3.7. So basically the market is suggesting Liverpool win this match 3-1, which I think feels about right, to be honest. And uh, I've got no real thirst to get behind uh, you know, short quotes on, on a high goal angle. So I thought the sensible solution here was to back a nice price, which is Liverpool to win and both teams to score. Um, I did it at the KP. I was quite happy with my, my angle. It's obviously higher oh. variance than all the other angles, but I just think Leicester still possess all that quality in forward areas, but are absolutely hopeless defensively too. So three clean sheets all season in the Premier League, but 70% of their Premier League matches have featured both teams scoring. I think they're more than good enough to get a goal. Uh, they scored three at the Etihad at, at the end of the day. So why can't they score at Anfield? So yeah, I think Liverpool will win this game quite comfortably, but Leicester to score too. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that you found the value at plus 140. I just hate the fact that Leicester are one of them teams that as soon as you think you've got your foot on their throat, they, they find a way out and... 
Oh, listen, I mean, I, just, I can't be with Leicester. That's as simple as that. And I hope Liverpool go and do the business. Uh, let's have a little look at the official picks because everything that we're saying, we want and hope that Liverpool do the business. It's Liverpool and both teams to score at plus 140. Even brings in the little 2-1, which means that you've got a plus 140, but would have lost with the under three and a half goal line. OK, so move on to the uh, final game. And as we do, remember, it's Q&A session coming up. So get your questions ready and I'll ask the boys. It's Wolves versus Arsenal. I expect this to be a very... I thought this might have been a two goal line. Wolves plus 250 on the money line. Um, draw double chance at minus 140 might attract a few. Arsenal plus 120. Not so sure that they should be that, that price, to be honest. Uh, total under or over two and a half goals. Draw is a plus 230 stinch. I'm thinking Wolves might be better than Arsenal if they're allowed to play. But everything tells me this could be nil-nil. Yeah, definitely. I agree with everything you, you started off with, really. I thought the goal line would have been a bit shorter, given how good Wolves have been defensively this season. I looked immediately, I looked and saw that plus 120 on Arsenal. And I thought, have they, you know, have, they, have we gone back 10 years and they re-signed Van Persie, for example? Um, no way, no way I would be back in Arsenal at, at those odds. I was. This is kind of similar to the Burnley Man United game for me in, in my approach. Like I, I wanted to get Wolves on side, but I've seen that. I look at team news and uh, Hwang's going to. I think Hwang will be out for Wolves, and he's like their second top goal scorer this season. And uh, I thought Arsenal might have a few missing uh, players as well, but it looks like some of the um, players that they were set to be missing are going to be back as well. Um, so they, uh, particularly central midfield, I think uh, they they were looking like they might have some absentees there. So I thought they might not be very cohesive. But um, yeah, I think I think these two might just cancel each other out. To be honest, I mean, uh, kind of leaning towards more of the sort of Wolves data. You know, 16 of their 21 games this season have been under 2.5 by far. The the best team in the league in terms of uh, low scoring games. Their matches average just 1.67 goals per game. They've got a second best defence, but they're just the third worst scorers. Um, I think when you look at the underlying data, that doesn't quite reflect. But, you know, Raul Jimenez was away last week. They've lost Adama Traore to Barcelona. So I think they're still trying to find their feet a little bit in uh, offensively. And I think what's quite good in that respect is, you know, Bruno Lager has uh, managed to, you know, get them up into the into the top half. You know, they're sitting... They're sitting at uh, eighth. They've got games in hand on uh, multiple games in hand on teams above them, and you know, real good chance of progressing further. I'm a little bit disappointed though that they, you know they didn't strengthen in the window themselves either. You know, uh, maybe the players they wanted weren't available. The asking prices were too high. You know, we don't we're not privy to that information. But yeah, I just think Bruno Lago is doing a really good job. That defence is very well marshaled by Connor Connor Cody. I think. Um, I think he's set this week with this game to be the sixth highest uh, appearances for Wolves all time, which just goes to show, you know, how long he's been there and how highly he's rated. You know, he was converted from a central midfielder into a central defender. So, you know, I think he's got that reading of the game coming from coming from that position. And uh, yeah, I just think confidence at Arsenal must be really, really low at the moment. They they didn't strengthen in January. They had the whole saga with with losing Aubameyang, which I think. It was a shocking piece of business, really. You know, they spent 70 million euros on him four years ago and then allowed him to leave on a free transfer with with no replacement. Just really, really bad business. Looks as though the same thing might happen to Lacazette. Uh, Enketia, his contract's expiring at the end of the season and it looks like he might leave as well. Um, and, you know, if they're not getting into the Champions League or Europa League, they're not getting that um, finances got knocked out of the cup by Forest, um, got knocked out of the cup by Liverpool, a Liverpool team that was weakened without Salah and Mane and, and Arsenal were the ones that were heading into that tie on a high because they'd got the 0-0 at Anfield with 10 men for the majority of the game. And then you think perfect game for them to get back on track would be Burnley at home. Well, a stubborn Burnley team kept them to a 0-0 and it's and they failed to score in the last four games now. So, yeah, um, I think player, I think I mentioned Lacazette, but he... I'm not sure if he's getting, you know, past his uh, his peak or whether he's struggling because he's not getting the creativity behind him working. Um, yep. Yeah, so I'm going for under two go under two and a half goals at, at minus 145. I looked at going for under 2.25, but there was only a slight price increase, and I just thought I, I really want to get paid if there's two goals, and and if there was if there was two goals in the on the other bet, I'd only get half winning. So. 
Yeah, maybe, maybe being slightly greedy. Uh, but yeah, I, I just think I just see a low-scoring game. So fully prepared now for a 4-0 Arsenal win. No, there's no chance of it. I, honestly, I can't see anything. I just looked at draw half-time, which is minus 105. If you went with, and you're happy with a draw, and you went with draw Arsenal at plus 450, or Wolves draw, or draw Wolves is like 600. Marco here, I can't see anything other than a draw here, especially at half-time, and I definitely see under three goals. Yeah, sorry, just to interject Flash very quickly. Wolves have drawn the most matches in the first half of the season, 14 out of And last year, and and the year before that. All their goals come in the last 25 minutes. They they set up to contain, and then they they, they add, they go go a bit more expansive after the break. Oh, they're they're the most alert and intelligent footballing team there is. They find a way and they probe and then once they're like almost like a snake. They sit there and they wait and they wait and they waggle their tail. And when a team bites on it, they punish. They've done it. That's how they've contained. That's how they've continued to be a Premier League side. Um, but one thing they're not is early on going for. They don't like to be go behind in games. And I don't see Arsenal. I see it nil nil at half time. I really do. Mark O'Hare, please throw some more light on this game because for me it's got to be the unders. Yeah, I was nodding along with most of what you all said, really. And I think Wolves, um, Wolves are a team I, I normally want to get on side with a, a decent handicap start against the big guns because of everything you've all said. I think they're very capable. They're very well set up and they're very good at frustrating teams. But um, I looked at their record against the top half this season. They played nine games, three wins, one draw, five defeats. But what's absolutely incredible really out of those nine games, they've all ended either 1-0 or 0-0. Um, so no games featured two or more goals against the top half. Um, and obviously, Stinch has already said that their matches overall are averaging 1.67 goals per game. But certainly against the best teams in the league, that average drops even further. So, you know, it's a it's a reasonable sample as well. And I think, um, you know, we, we don't need to try and second guess how they're going to approach this match. But I think it's been given further clout, really, by what they did at the weekend in the FA Cup. Um, Bruno Large was coming out after the game and, and complaining by uh, his standards, basically saying there's there's a lack of options in forward areas since Trey Orish sale and, and then all the injuries that uh, Stinch talked about. Trin Cowles had COVID as well recently, so he was unavailable. So they've had to switch systems and, and change their tact, basically, is what he was saying. And those selection issues aren't going away this midweek. So, you know, they're going to try and contain and counter and see what they can do. But ultimately, they've scored multiple goals just six times this season in the Premier League, all of which came against bottom half teams. They've only conceded multiple goals in three games, which is the same as Man City and Chelsea. So elite defence, but not so elite going forward. Uh, you know, I can't really sort of carry on any further because Stinch has stolen all my, my stats and numbers. Oh, exactly. But um, yeah, I mean, from an Arsenal perspective, despite all the negatives of failing to score in four across all comps, winless in five since Boxing Day when they beat Norwich, um, they've actually kept 10 clean sheets in 21 Premier League games this season. And that's one thing we've kind of not really associated with Arsenal in recent years. Uh, Arteta has definitely got them better uh, defensively, but just uh, still struggling to find that balance right now. So, yeah, I think it's got unders all over at this one. It's under two and a half. It's now minus 150. It's like moving. It's almost like it's live bet. <laughs> it's like it just stinks of maybe Arsenal getting a late goal or uh, it's, it's, it's massive that plus 450 of draw half time. Draw half time minus 105 should be the way to go um, if you think that the under two and a half at minus 150 is just a little bit too steep. Let's have a little look at the official picks and then it's time for the, uh, for the Q&A. It's under two and a half at minus 145. For Stinch it is moving in the opposite direction as well, um, but again we don't see anything other than basically a dull game. And if you wanted to have a few seconds on nil nil, I wouldn't put anyone off. I really wouldn't. Or no goal scorer. Go with no goal scorer because if it's nil nil and someone scores an own goal, you still get the no goal scorer and the nil nil still pays uh, pays your way. Okay, so it's question and answer time, and then we'll do the official pick. So here we go. Uh, first of all, Steve Gregory is he's like a little bit of raw war and peace. Here. It's uh, Lampard's Chelsea created pure chaos up front, but lacked defensive structure. A good time to keep an eye on both teams to score props for the next few Everton games. I, I smashed Everton at the weekend because they were against Brentford. Let me tell you now, as a performance, I'd give them, Marco here, five out of ten. What are your thoughts on Everton and how long is it going to take for him to get it right? Yes, they won 4-1, but listen, if ever a performance sort of or a scoreline masqueraded the performance and that was it uh yeah i mean 
such an underwhelming appointment, I think, from Everton. I think there's uh, many candidates out there who possibly would be better suited for that role. Um, but yeah, I agree with, with the question, actually, that um, Everton at the moment going forward will be really an interesting one to kind of follow for the goals-based bets because he's right, Chelsea were uh, were pretty hectic under Lampard going forward and defensively a bit of a shambles. And we saw that change almost instantaneously under Thomas Tuchel. So uh, I was very interested to see what shape and what system he performed at the weekend with Everton. I think it was about a 3-4-3, basically, a bit of a wing-backs system. Um, still struggling to get sort of key players back on the field. And I saw Ben Godfrey went off injured and he'll be missing midweek as well. They're going against uh, away to Newcastle, which I think is an interesting game. And both teams to score was... Hopefully on my shortlist, the price is a bit too short for where I wanted it. But um, certainly Newcastle at St. James's Park with their new players on the field will fancy their chances against an Everton team who don't often convince themselves on the road. So I think it's a goal-heavy game. Uh, and I think Everton matches going forward could be quite fun to follow as too. So, yeah, I agree. OK, uh, the, then Darren Williams, he says Everton versus Newcastle. There is no such thing as Everton versus Newcastle this week, Darren. It's Newcastle versus Everton, which is completely different to Everton versus Newcastle because Stinch, Newcastle versus Everton. I watched Everton so, so closely at the weekend because they were one of my favourites. How I got away of it, I was so close to going with Newcastle to win this game, you know. Yeah, I, I, when I was, uh, I looked at the fixtures before I looked at the odds and I thought in my head, how would I price this? And I was thought I might price this sort of 50-50 or maybe Everton's slight favourites. I'm, I'm not that impressed with Newcastle's transfer business, particularly in the attacking uh, box with the signing of Chris Wood. They're still missing Callum Wilson. But having said that, Calvert-Lewin's a doubt as well. Um, so that's maybe, I was surprised, again, that um, Overs is the underdog. So Overs is uh, is minus 105, but uh, Unders is, is the favourite at minus 115. I thought that might be the other way around, but yeah, that probably explains why, because you know potentially both teams' main goal scorers are missing. So that's the only reason for, for me leaving it. Um, I think, but if I think if, if, uh, if we see goals, uh, I wouldn't be surprised. And yeah, I think um, uh, the the guy in the chat makes a, a great observation and that uh, something that uh, maybe we can take advantage of when when Calvert Lewin's back fit and while the odds are still suggesting that Everton are struggling going forward because the odds are probably based on Everton this season as a whole when we know that Calvert Lewin's miss you know 50% or, or I think maybe more than 50% of those games and we just we just know he's a great he's a great guy between the sticks, isn't he? We don't want him doing the work in the channels. We leave that to Richarlison, to Murray Gray, Townsend, etc. But Calvert-Lewin, between the sticks and the 18-yard box, is lethal, really. Uh, got fantastic records since uh, sort of Ancelotti moved him into that central uh, lone striker position. So, yeah, just another one where it's a bit annoying. I would like to jump on board with overs, but uh, just the fact that no Wilson and, no, and maybe no Calvert-Lewin is the only reason that sort of puts me off. Yeah, maybe 1-1. One, one. Maybe the draw at plus 245. You can't go near these two sides. And I'm telling you now, you can't go near Everton. Uh, they got away with absolute murder at the weekend. OK, so no more Q and A. Remember, you'll be joining us again on Thursday. Let me take you back to the beginning. And if you like this video, and why wouldn't you, uh, please subscribe. Get us closer to 4,000. We are closing in more and more, ever closer and closer every single day. But ring the bell. Ring the bell means you'll never miss any content again. And we have everything. But it's Super Bowl weekend. We've got NCAAB. We've got NHL. We've got MLB coming up very, very soon. We'll have golf, tennis, horse racing. And it's World Cup year. Champions League next Monday. Europa League next Tuesday. Listen, you're not going to have to leave your house. Just put feet up, cup of tea, biscuit, and you can listen to my uh, my experts. So, Marco, how? Let's uh, let's eat into this deficit. Stinch, same as you. Let's get this total up where it should be. But to everyone in the chat, thumbs up on the way out at the moment. I'm just under 50%. Here's the official pick. So, um, I'm liking my Palace money line. Liverpool and both teams to score at plus 140 jumps off the page. And Wolves Arsenal under 2.5 should just be an absolute gimme. Minus 145. Moving in the opposite direction. So make sure you get on that. You can see that definitely being a draw at half time at minus 105. So Stinch, Marco here. Have a great couple of days. I'll see you all again on Thursday. Same time, same place for everyone at Bet US. You take care.